A warm welcome to everyone joining us today for our webinar discussing GDPR compliance. I'm Liz Imri from Securonix and your webinar host today. Before we begin, I would like to go over some WebEx housekeeping points. Your audio is muted throughout the session, but we encourage you to submit questions via the chat function in the bottom right hand of your screen. I'll gather these questions together and present them to our panelists during our Q&A session at the end. If we're unable to answer all of your questions during our allocated time today, don't worry. We will contact you individually after the session's finished. A recording of this webinar will be available along with a copy of the presentation after the session. So without further delay, may I present to you our three panelists for today's webinar. Jonathan Jacobs is a regulatory specialist with practical GDPR experience and a strategic business architect from Spire Minds UK. Nita Nagali is our Senior Vice President of Products here at Securonix, and Alex Rodriguez is the Chief Technical Officer of Big Data International. These three panelists are experts in data security, security analytics, and GDPR compliance. They will outline the steps your organization should take to become GDPR compliant, avoid costly penalties, and we'll look at how an analytics-based approach can help. So Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Liz. Hello, thank you for joining the call. I'm sure many of you have been bombarded with articulate and eloquent GDPR experts over the past few months, predicting the end of the world once May 2018, if not compliant. Uh, to be clear, I am not a GDPR expert, but what I possess is a lot of battle scars and experience managing large programs. That is included working with many regulatory bodies such as the ICO, FCA, IRS, HMRC, to name a few. And most recently, over the last few months, I've had the opportunity to manage a GDPR program as well as advise a few clients on how to monetize, plan, and implement a GDPR program within their organizations. So let's get started. GDPR is coming into effect 25th May 2018 and Brexit will not have an impact. Most if not all companies currently capturing, storing, processing and managing an individual's personal identifiable information will require to adhere to GDPR. This includes employee information as well as your cloud provider and outsourcing partners if you are using them. In a recent survey, it came to light that only 6.9% of cloud providers commit to not sharing data with third parties, and only 18% delete data immediately on account termination. So it's important for those of you on the call to ensure you have the right team and technology advisors when developing a GDPR program. of work because it is complicated and it will impact all facets of your business. Non-compliance is risky because the level of fines that can be possibly levied is very high. But it's something important to remember. The ICO and us are not here to fear monger. And most importantly, these sort of fines which you hear going about, the 4% and 20 million euro, would generally be levied to those organizations with severe breaches. So next slide, please. Uh, thank you. So, so first and foremost, it's most important and clear uh, to understand what the ICO wants as a regulatory body. It's not to punish or to purposely cause disruption. GDPR has been, has been in the works since 2012, and it came into force last spring. To put into perspective, uh, the cost of fraud averages approximately 8.9 billion to 30 billion. In a survey recently done around 2015, uh, 2.1 million individuals suffer fraud and 1.8 million suffer fraud without loss, financial loss. So this basically averages out to one in 12 adults suffer fraud and one in 22 victims of cybercrime. Uh, from a personal example, most recently, my aunt was one of them who was unfortunately had 200 pounds taken from her account via a telephone scam. And it turned out the scammers bought this data from a charity company going bust. So next slide. So to simply put it, the ICO want businesses to be accountable for the information they hold on their customers. The folks at the ICO believe that implementing GDPR will help protect individuals like you and I from having our information misused. And this is a very important thing. 
uh, I'm sure many of you out there have received many anonymous calls talking and claiming that you've had car accidents or misplaced PPI. Uh, the question to ask is where are they getting this information from? Uh, next slide, please. So the key element here and the primary area of this discussion today is how do we evidence GDPR compliance? The ICO have provided guidance on their website and I definitely recommend any of you that are looking to kickstart a program to go through the information, read and understand it. But most importantly, when doing so, don't develop this plan in isolation. GDPR impacts all facets of your business and it is going to require continued upkeep and a robust, a robust sorry, technology backbone that can clearly provide linkage of how the controls within an organization meet the regulatory requirements put down. Technology and solutions that SecureNex and Big Data International offer are versatile solutions to allow for this. I can, it provides clear traceability, management, audit, auditability, and investigation when and if a breach takes place. Plus, not to mention SecureNex is one of the only user and entity behavior analytical solutions in the market it's also been mentioned by Garth. So most importantly, and I've seen this happen with many companies, three of the eight I'm currently working with, using Excel sheets. Please don't. Excel sheets cannot help and they are very, very bulky to use. I would recommend using systems that are scalable and can easily provide a linkage from the control you intend to put into place to the regulation, as well as versatility in being able to interact with other reporting tools that your current DPO as well as the compliance team use. For example, ServiceNow. Now, for those of you that have been audited, it is very important to provide this level of transparency, especially with companies and technologies that are easily GDPR scalable. Because at the end of the day, when the regulator comes to ask you, are you compliant or not? It is the role of the organization to make sure and evidence that they are. Can I have the next slide, please? So this is one of the biggest issues I know a lot of people are facing and trying to understand why GDPR is not being kick-started everywhere. So the simple fact is GDPR is expensive. And unfortunately, there has been a lot happening around the world that is forcing companies to play and wait the play the sorry play and wait the watching game, the wait and watch game. But this is not an approach that should be taken, uh, because come next year, those companies that are not compliant, and if asked to be self-certified and unable to do so, would not be very looked upon very favorable by the ICO. So it's a recommendation to our clients to start evidencing the fact. And this can be done through having discussed at the board level and documented. Most recently, Elizabeth Denham, current head of the ICO, has confirmed at a, current, at, a, at a recent parliamentary hearing that the ICO will be adopting GDPR and that it will come into force. For those asking the question, what about Brexit? Unofficially, as well as officially, it's talked about that once Brexit is official and the UK has split from the EU, the United Kingdom will continue to use this regulation with minor amendments. However, the essence of GDPR will continue to be used. So to be clear, it is very important to take this seriously. Can I have the next slide, please? So for those of you in the audience that are unfortunately with an organization currently playing the wait and watch game, because of the goalposts constantly moving. Uh, uh, I think it's important to sit up and start making a little bit of noise within your organizations. Uh, for example, listed here are a few companies that are currently taking GDPR seriously. And from it, you can see most of these sectors ranging from the banking industry all the way to the FMCG industry are taking this seriously because they are wary of understanding that breaches in the future could be very costly for them. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So how can we help? To prepare for the new regulation, organizations will need to have a clear understanding of their current compliance position. 
So it's important as a first step, as an organization, to understand where your data lies, who is accountable for it, where is it located in organizations, where is it transferred from and to. By helping you understand these issues, we can help obviously develop and prioritize remediation plans. And we are currently doing this for a few clients. Now I'm going to hand over to Nitin, who will give you a further detailed understanding of how Securinix can actually help. Over to you. Thank you, Nitin. Thank you, Jonathan. Can we go to the next slide, please? Good morning, everyone. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, security analytics and how Securonix can help you with your GDPR compliance requirements. So we'll start with what security analytics is. Then we'll talk about some of the specific requirements GDPR has around data protection and data privacy. And then we'll talk about Securonix's capabilities to address those requirements. So Securonix security analytics platform analyzes events. So it monitors events in real time uh, using automated machine learning techniques. And it baselines normal behavior in your environment. And then it looks for any deviations from that normal behavior. And this analytics is performed on a big data platform. So you can have massive scalability to support the large data volumes you have. And also it can process data at machine speed. So you can detect threat in real time. And the type of threat you're looking for is insiders. So these could be your um, trusted insiders that are either intentionally or unintentionally accessing data, and this could be our employee sensitive data or uh, customer sensitive data. Um, or these could be external attackers uh, like malware and ransomware um, that are launching a targeted attack on your environment. Or these threats could be coming from, um, um, from your environment that is hosted in cloud. So a lot of organizations are moving to cloud um, adopting solutions like Office 365, Google Apps. And as you're moving your data outside of your environment, it is even more critical to monitor the, that environment to look for any suspicious activity in that environment. And while you're doing this monitoring, what's critical from a GDPR perspective is you're protecting the privacy of the users that you're monitoring. And these could be your internal users um, or the target users, which could be your customers. So Securonix has data privacy capabilities where you can mask and encrypt the actors and the target um, uh, employees um, so that all you are analyzing is the actual transaction that is happening in your environment and, and then looking for any anomalies. And once you've identified an anomaly in a transaction, then you can go back and say, hey, I have sufficient evidence that this event is bad. Now I want to unmask and see who the entity is that is performing this malicious activity or has been compromised. And to unmask that information, you'll need a privacy key, which can sit with HR or legal team, and you can follow an exception process to, to obtain that privacy key. Next slide, please. So um, talking about some of GDPR's key requirements when it comes to data protection, I mean, at the gist of it, you have to protect information related to employees or customer data. No matter what shape or form you are storing that information is in information and you have to make sure that information is protected. And to do that, you have to, for GDPR, you need to have privacy built into your solution. And these could be solutions that are actually storing the data or any other solution that is monitoring or processing that data. Um, GDPR also provides several rights to data subjects, like consent, um, right to access information, right for information to be forgotten, so they can ask you for reports on information that you are collecting for them. They can ask you to delete the information that you have collected for them. And the tools that they're using or solutions that you're using should provide you a way to do that. And lastly, and most importantly, if there is a data breach in your environment, you need to be able to report that breach within 72 hours of becoming aware of that breach. Now, if I were to translate this into key risks that you need to watch out for, um, you need to look for, is there any unauthorized access to the data store where you're collecting this information? And now this could be your HR system, this could be your SAP, ERP application system, 
um, or it could be your data processing system um, if you are a data processor. You should also watch out for any unauthorized or accidental disclosure of this information. Um, you should look for any loss or alteration of data, and lastly, any bulk exfiltration of this information to the outside world. And this could be, you know, uploads that are done to external destinations or people sending emails out with this information. Next slide, please. So how can Securonix help with monitoring some of these data stores where you have sensitive data? So what the Securonix solution does is it will collect events from your data stores, and these could be transactions, these could be security events generated by these data stores, and it will automatically start baselining these events um, using machine learning algorithms. So we have patented machine learning algorithms um, that that will kick in and start monitoring activities in your environment and start baselining what normal looks like in your environment. And then it will look for any deviation in behavior. And these baselines that get created, they are created unique to an actor, um, unique to a time slice. So there will be a different baseline for a day of the week or time of the day and so on. Um, and specific transactions that you're doing. So certain transactions are more critical than the other. So you want to have individual baselines for each transaction uh, within a particular system. And that system that you're monitoring could be an application, like I said, like the ERP application. It could be a database where you have all your data stored, or it could be a network device, which is um, in between um, the, the application and the end user, and you want to monitor that as well. And when we are creating these baselines, we're creating them for users that we want to monitor. We're also creating them for peer groups or group of users. And the reason why peer groups is important is because an admin going in and doing a certain type of action might be okay. And if I compare that action against other admins, um, it will look like a normal activity. But if an intern goes in and does the same activity, that would be anomalous for, for that group of users or interns. We also look for rare events. So as the system is baselining what normal looks like uh, in your environment, um, it will look for anything that has occurred for the first time in your environment. And this could be, say, a, a service account, which always has a local login, suddenly logging in from an external IP address outside of your organization. Or this could be a service account that always does backup, suddenly is being used to query critical tables on your database. So all of these anomalous activities are identified by the system automatically without you having to manually configure any rules, and then um, those are flagged as outliers. Next slide, please. Now, some of the sample use cases um, when we talk about data breach, so I mentioned you should be uh, looking for any anomalous access to your sensitive application. And anomalous access could be, is this person first of all required to do this activity? What time of the day did we perform the action? What location did we perform the action from? What was the frequency of that activity? So if, I, if I'm going in and looking at, as a doctor, I'm going in and looking at one patient's data or two patient's data, that may be my normal behavior. If I'm going in and accessing a record for 1,000 patients, that could be suspicious. You're also looking for any sudden spikes in data downloads or egress from your critical system. So if you have PCI assets where you're storing customer data, you want to monitor if there is any egress of data from those critical systems. You're looking for anomalous activity compared to peers. So is there an IT user who's an health test guy going in and accessing patient data in case of healthcare? And then we're also looking for any anomalous uploads or downloads to a cloud application. Like I mentioned in the beginning, um, a lot of data is moving to cloud. So you can have users in your environment that may move data to your cloud-hosted application like Box or Office 365 and then go home and download that information using their personal email address. And now they have caused a data breach without violating any policy uh, on, for your on-prem um, requirement. So the way we implement these use cases is in the form of package solutions. 
So, um, so these packet solutions come in come with built-in connectors to connect to 350 plus um, different systems and applications, and it has 800 plus threat models built in. So what that means is, um, if, if you want to implement this in your environment and you have a five applications, the system can automatically integrate with those five applications, and the relevant use cases will be available to you to just plug and play and, and start monitoring your environment for any um, data breaches. Next slide, please. So you can identify anomalies, and you know, depending on the size of your environment, there could be several anomalies identified in your environment. So the important question is, how do I prioritize the most riskiest event? Um, especially when it just comes to compliance and reporting breach within 72 hours, you need to be able to see the breach in real time as it occurs, so you have enough time to investigate and report. So Citronix um, has a risk modeling uh, algorithm, which is um, looking to prioritize your high risk events. And there are several ways we do that. We use context information as risk boosters. So for example, if an action is performed that is anomalous, we look at the actor um, and the profile of the actor. And if the profile of the actor is telling me that the actor is an untrusted actor, like an intern or a contractor, the system will prioritize that over a trusted user doing the same activity. Now, the next thing is, what is the information that is in access? So what is the target? And if the target is an asset, the system has metadata related to the asset that it is collecting. And if that metadata is telling me that this asset is a, a PCI sensitive asset, then the system will use that information to reduce the risk associated with the anomaly. And the third thing is, what is the actual transaction? You can have thousands of transactions going on on our application, but there are certain transactions that are more critical than the others. And you want to prioritize these more critical transactions so that you can, um, you can use that as risk boosters for, for anomalies that have been identified. You focus on the actor, you focus on the target system on which action is performed, and you focus on the actual action and based on these three parameters, you can elevate the risk associated with an anomaly. And this is built into our 800 plus set model. So for a specific application like SAP, we know what the critical transactions are. Based on your identity information um, in your organization, the system brings in that identity information as context. Um, we can prioritize certain users or group of users at high risk and that information can be used as risk boosters. In addition to that, you also look at, is this event that is anomalous, is it a one-off event, or is it a pattern that I need to monitor for? And if it is a pattern, then that pattern gets triggers a threat model or key chain that, are, that is built into the solution. And if a key chain is triggered, then, then the risk associated with that particular incident will be much higher risk compared to an individual anomaly. And what I mean by that is, if I am looking at um, a set of events and I see that there is a rare login by a contractor, so he's logging in on a weekend and he never does that before, and then I see that contractor is going in and accessing information that none of the peers um, that have similar role as him do, doing that activity, then I see him taking that information that he has accessed and emailing it to himself and I see a huge spike in, in the email he's sending. And then if I see audit logs been cleared, now that sequence of events together tells me that this is uh, the most riskiest activity I should be monitor, monitoring. And it triggers the threat model, and that threat model then elevates the risk associated with that incident. Now, <clears throat> you have the ability to, in, in Securonix, to go in and look at these threat models and edit them if you like, so you can say, hey, I want to add another condition that is relevant to me. Um, in, in, instead of contractors, these are four other types of users that I want to add to this threat model. You have the ability to do that. You also have the ability to play around with the risk scores. For example, if the system by default is turning this risk score into 100, and you feel like, hey, 100 is not the right amount of risk score I want, I want it to be 1,000 because if I look at the risk scores in my environment, 
to for this to stand out, I need the score to be a little higher. You have the ability to go in and modify these threat models to um, to change the multipliers and 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 increase the risk scores if you need. Next slide, please. So once you've identified an incident, you want the ability to, as the, as you're reporting the incident, you want the ability to collect evidence related to the incident, maintain the chain of custody, and you also want the ability to respond to that incident. And so Cyclonix has built-in workflows that can help you automate escalation and notification of incidents. So for example, if a notification needs to go out to HR and legal about an incident related to GDPR data, the system can auto-trigger that, um, and this could be an email that goes out and so on. You also have incident response playbooks built into the solution to respond to an incident. For example, if an incident has been caused by an actor and you want to now go in and um, disable access for that actor, the system has integrations with IAM solutions and integrations with Active Directory to automatically go in and block the access for that user so that he is no longer able to do any more damage to their environment um, while you are going in and investigating. So these playbooks are built in. You have the ability to go in and look at the playbooks and decide which ones you want to enable so you can take automated action on malicious actors. And then in certain cases, you want to have centralized monitoring and you have your own incident or case management system. In that case, the solution has the ability to integrate with tools like Remedy, ServiceNow, Jira, wherein we can pass on the incident information to those tools, and then you can handle your investigation outside the tool if that's, that's desired. But the solution has built-in dashboards for case management. It has built-in the workflow, and these dashboards and workflows are fully customizable in case you need to go in and, um, and uh, treat them based on your specific needs. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to um, the, the analytics and the investigation parts, you want to have the ability to monitor um, your compliance status on a, on a daily basis. So Citronix provides out-of-the-box dashboards and reporting around compliance requirements. So, um, and this could be a PCI compliance requirement, SIPA compliance requirements, or in this case, GDPR compliance requirements. And these dashboards will, will show you specific events um, that are most, most interesting around the compliance regulation that you're most concerned about. And again, these dashboards are also customizable um, to, to specific views that you want to see. There's also granular role-based access control built-in so um, a team that is responsible for compliance may be different from a team that is responsible for incident response. And you want to keep the information separate um, or logically, um, in which case the solution has support for granular role-based access control so that you can limit access to individuals to specific screens and specific data um, so that there is segregation of duty and then there is um, uh, roles based on business needs. And you also have the ability to create um, ad hoc reports. So there's out of the box report, compliance reports that can get generated and scheduled um, on, a, on a periodic basis, but you can also generate ad hoc reports from the UI. And this is important for the GDPR requirement where um, a data subject can say, hey, I want reports related to all the activities that you're tracking for me in which case you can go in the tool and say, um, on SAP, give me all the activities for user XYZ for the last six months. And the system will pull out every single event that has been recorded for that particular actor. And that report can then be um, published in any format you prefer. GDPR requires it to be in a, in a readable format. So any of the formats that we support, Excel, PDF, CDF, CSV, all of those are readable formats. Um, so you can export the report in that format and provide it to the end user. Next slide, please. 
So, so we talked about capabilities of Securonic solution as a monitoring tool to to detect breaches in your environment, to provide you the capabilities to investigate breaches, and the compliance reporting uh, around it. Now, when you are bringing in data related to transactions that are happening in your environment, you are by default bringing in information that is sensitive from a GDR, GDPR perspective. So what you want to be careful about is any tool that you're using for monitoring will fall under the purview of GDPR because GDPR goes up to saying if there is a IP address or even a machine name that can tie uniquely back to the um, user, then, then that is in scope for GDPR. So any tool you're using, not just this, you've got to be careful about what kind of information is going into that solution and does that fall um, under the GDPR umbrella. So Sikronix will, to some extent, fall in that umbrella, so you want to make sure that you have the right controls enabled so that you are, you are staying in compliance with the GDPR requirements. And some of the specific requirements are data pseudonymization, which is a variation of how you encrypt data, and I'll talk about it, limiting access based on business needs, and then um, some of the data subject rights uh, should be supported by that tool as well in terms of collecting data or forgetting what data has been collected. So um, from a secure, Securonix data privacy capability, we have the ability to mask and or encrypt data. And when we are encrypting data, we are encrypting it using a key, and that key is stored separately from the encrypted data. And that helps us meet the pseudonymization requirement for GDPR. When what GDPR says is just masking of data is not enough, you should have mask it with a key that is stored separately, which is what Securonix does. Um, and that key, um, as I mentioned earlier, can sit with, um, with your legal or privacy team so once your investigation team has done their due diligence and said, this user is risky, I want to look at who it is, they can go to the legal and HR team, bring them in, provide them all the evidence, and then request the key to unmask um, who the user was. The system has granular role-based access, so you can limit who gets access to what. So you can have an analyst screen, and they get access to the information they need. You have executives who get a higher level view. You have admins who don't need access to the data, but they do need access to the tool to take care of the operations. Um, so you can define different roles and give, give them permission. And this can be integrated with your Active Directory, so you're not managing anything locally. This can be tied to your AD groups. The authentication can be tied to your Active Directory as well, so there's no password stored in the tool and so on. The solution also has detailed audit trail capabilities. So every event that occurs in the solution, you can maintain a detailed audit trail of that event um, so you can go back and see if there was any tampering with the data. This is how you can also ensure that the chain of custody is maintained and that any data that has been collected is not being tampered with. Um, there is log tampering uh, capability as well, which even enabled any attempt to um, change the data or delete audit logs will be um, detected and alerted on. Um, the solution has activity reporting capabilities. This is when I mentioned, um, you know, you can generate reports for different types of activities, um, and these could be activities done by a user or a group of users in your environment, and um, this will help you with the providing um, your users with the information uh, related to them that you're collecting. For example, if you're monitoring your employees for access to a sensitive system, um, and the employee comes in and says, hey, you're monitoring my activities. I need the report on all my activities that you have collected. The solution has the ability to run that activity report and provide you with the data. And lastly, data filters. Data filters enables you to selectively um, include or exclude certain users from monitoring. For example, you are a global organization you, you want to monitor um, actions by users, but there is a certain geography that is not permitting you to do that. So you can exclude 
users from that geography and still have your program up and running while you work on getting approval for that geography. Um, or you may have users saying, I do not provide you consent to monitor me, in which case you need the ability to selectively exclude those users from your monitoring while you still monitor the rest. Um, so these data filters are applied at the uh, time of data ingest to exclude certain types of users. This could be done based on, say, the name of the user, so you're excluding a particular user, or based on the location, say, I want to exclude everybody in Germany, um, so, or, or any other attributes related to the identity of the user, like department, division, and so on. So, um, so Securonix has global presence, so our customers have uh, deployments in EMEA, APAC, Americas, and um, even before GDPR was, was a big um, concern, organizations have always been concerned about privacy. And so the solution has been currently been deployed at several, um, in several countries in EMEA and APAC, and we have gone in front of works councils and um, our customers have presented um, cases to their um, to their work councils on why monitoring um, of this type of activity is important when you're concerned about data breach, especially organizations like healthcare, finance, manufacturing, where you're concerned about uh, not just your customer and employee information, but also your intellectual property. Um, you want the ability to monitor, but to securely monitor, you need to demonstrate to the works councils all the data privacy capabilities um, that the tool can provide. And so um, so our customers have been able to convince their works councils um, that this is the right tool based on the privacy capability it provides and, and, the, and the analytics capability it provides in detecting breaches. Next slide, please. Oh, this is, um, so off to Alex. Thank you, Nathan. My name is Alex Rodriguez. I'm the CTO for Big Data International, and uh, we are experts in building next generation of data platforms, both in the cloud and, and on-premise. And today, I'm going to talk about Datascope, which is our solution for the GDPR challenge that sits very well along Securonix platform. I'll start with a high-level view on the architecture. Uh, uh, the Datascope applies big data uh, technology, namely Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark, to combine multiple data sources, metadata, and also captured consent and regulatory obligations. The solution features uh, an agent-based architecture uh, that can be deployed across your organization, uh, across your multiple data repositories, and also data platforms, and can scan data assets for, for personal identifiable information and stream data usage events into the data scope service. Next slide, please. Yeah, you can go there. Okay. So data usage events uh, are checked against onboarded consent by data Datascope's policy enforcer, and uh, it highlights potentially uh, violations of the consent regarding usage and data retention, and also monitors policy adherence. It's also the purpose of Datascope platform, not only to assess risk, but also to enable applications to check for consent when they are about to process personal information. This, is, this can be done by the consent check API, and this is truly a way to uh, build applications from scratch that are privacy-enabled by design, and for DPOs to easily provide interaction information of applications and personal data, and demonstrate that uh, to supervisor authorities like ICO. Securonix, uh, as a user and behavior analytics platform, can help with insider threat detection, and it can also feed from the consent violation events that Datascope generates and improve the risk models for data breaches by providing consent violation context information.
platform is. To manage that, uh, you need the right tools to understand where your private data is. So Datascope leverages the interoperable data formats to massage data sets and understand where the data is, and also centralize that metadata in Datascope service. On the other hand, if you have finer grain policy specifications as imposed by the GDPR regulation, it helps us in classify what is and what's not allowed to use that data for, and also what kind of data sharing policies can be applied to that data. The constraints range from a data retention that may be imposed by regulators like FCA, for example, financial data has to be kept for seven years, for example, or to geographies where you can specify what kind of data, like healthcare data, cannot leave Germany, for example. Our vision with Datascope is to empower people and processes in the journey of GDPR by providing effective tools um, and also catalyze digital transformation across the organization. So try to reduce all the paper-based processes, for example. So Datascope basically captures metadata and helps reduce the request fulfillment for subject access requests, data portability requests, and also right to be forgotten requests. It's great to support large teams of, uh, of privacy to help with this cumbersome task of demonstrating regulation compliance. In this slide, I'm going through the, the personable identifiable information discovery process. Not, none of this could be achieved without machine learning uh, and fuzzy logic. Uh, and coming from a big data world, where um, I find abundant data either in a Smith structure and unstructured format, the engine discovers personable information based on patterns and fuzzy logic. So by applying pattern recognition, we can understand what's an address, what's a personal name, etc. The next step is to identify and relate that uh, those findings with data subjects. So the engine helps the data steward, the privacy steward, to curate all the relationships between all the personable information you have across your, your organization, either in employees' laptops or on your structured databases, and validate the relationship of those with each data subject, be it an employee a customer or even a job applicant. Finally, next slide, please. Finally, uh, monitoring of usage opens up a, a great opportunity for a more comprehensive insight. By feeding these events and all the violation, constant violation as a context information into Securonix, it can actually develop patterns and behavior on how your employees handle personal identifiable information. And that's not only key to report the breaches, but also on a preventive angle, understand, understand how they manipulate that information and have an implicit feedback loop and tool for planning actions such as training. Over to Liz. Thank you, Alex, and thank you the whole team for your presentation. Um, I have a few questions that have popped up on the screen during the session, um, and I'm going to try and guess who they are for. So I'm going to do them in order of the presentations. So let's see. Um, so Jonathan, here's one for you. How does the NIS or NIS directive impact security requirements within GDPR? <clears throat> Hi there. Um, so there is significant impact between GDPR and NIS. Both the laws mandate operators to implement a risk-based security measure, and both laws include notification requirements in the event of an incident. Um, however, there is a distinct in 
interest and it may apply to different types of incidents. So uh, to simply put it, uh, the NIS directive and GDPR have different rules for triggering this jurisdictions with a few exceptions. So, we, sorry, I'm not finished. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a bit long, it's not an easy answer, but uh, the NIS directive applies much more narrowly to operators of essential services and digital services providers. Thus, any overlap only occurs when respect to those operators. Uh, the second part is obviously the goal of GDPR is to safeguard personal data and the NIS directive is squarely focused on network security. So thus the GDPR requires controllers to adopt measures uh, that can secure personal data while the directive requires operators to appropriately secure their network in order to protect and provision the service. Uh, but definitely one thing is clear and that is Europe is taking uh, cybersecurity seriously and breach, and breach notification as well. So I think this is also for you too. Um, does GDPR impact all automated decisions and how will this impact profiling? Right, this is a good question and something I know which is in a lot of people's mind, a lot of people's mind and this is especially to do with those that are looking to implement artificial intelligence or automation within their systems. Uh, to simply put it, uh, this has been covered within the regulation and can be read about in Article 4, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to simply put it, no. The right does not apply if the decision, for example, is uh, something that needs to be done to enter into a performance or a contract between an individual and also it's authorized by law. So, you know, for example, fraud or tax evasion. Uh, with regards to the profiling element, uh, again, I know this is clearly defined within the regulation and there is still talk about this, but uh, it defines it primarily as things like performance at work, economic situations, health. Uh, they need to be very carefully, obviously, safeguarded. Uh, I, I could go on and on, I think, but uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, the ideal location would be to look at Article 4 and there is a lot of information currently out there about this when it comes to profiling. And uh, again, this is a personal recommendation, but those of you that have organizations that are very largely cloud-based, when systems like this are reviewing information and transferring information across jurisdictions, it would be very wise to obviously bring in your legal counsel as well as InfoSec when developing a strategy on how these systems like artificial intelligence or uh, automation are going to be profiling this information and where the information lies when this happens. Brilliant, thank you. Um, this one seems to be towards Nitin. How long does the system typically take to baseline normal behavior? That's a great question. Um, so typically the system requires uh, 30 days of data to baseline what normal looks like. Um, so now this 30 days of data can be something that the system can learn over time or it can be something that the system can collect historically. So if, you have, if you're collecting logs for your systems uh, for a long time and that data is available, the security solution can be deployed to collect data historically and build these behavior baseline so that as soon as it's deployed, it will have all the baselines ready and it can start monitoring your events in real time for anomalies. Thank you. And how long does it take to implement the solution? So the time to implement depends on the scope. So if you are more concerned about a couple of applications and that is all uh, you have in your environment, which is rare, in that case, the deployment can be done in a matter of a few days. So within a week, you can integrate those two or three systems. You can enable um, the, 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 the required use cases, and you can start monitoring the system. It will still take um, about 30 days so that it can baseline normal and detect um, uh, outliers, but the deployment itself can be within a week. And in larger environments where you have more complex systems and your, your scope of monitoring is broader than just a few applications, in that case, it can take anywhere between four to six to eight weeks um, to deploy the solution, to, to tune it to your required specific requirement, to do risk modeling if, you're, you know, if, you, if you want to prioritize the, the events based on certain criteria that you have 
Um, so, so it really depends um, on, on the size of your environment and the scope of your monitoring. Brilliant, thank you. Um, do data scope agents need to transfer all the data assets to the same location in order to find PII data? My concern is around network usage that can disrupt other business functions and also data transfer fees if the solution is running in the cloud. Oh, great, great question. Thanks for the question. Um, you're not the first one uh, asking that. Actually, uh, network usage is, is a concern when you're monitoring large quantities of data. So basically, data scope agents will scan incrementally all the data and will only transfer the PII findings into the central system. So that way, you don't incur into any cloud data transfer fees or uh, disrupt your network activity. Hope that answers your question. Thank you. I represent a data controller in the UK with UK customers and would like to know if we should still continue with GDPR due to the uncertainty of Brexit. I believe that's directed at me. Uh, so, um, if to answer that is, if you are if you process data about individuals in the context of selling goods or services uh, to citizens in the EU countries, uh, you will need to comply to GDPR, irrespective of whether you are not uh, in the UK. Retains post GD, sorry, will retain GDPR post Brexit. So, if your activities are limited to the UK then the position after the exit period is much less clear, is a little less unclear at this point of time. Uh, however, the UK government has indicated it will implement an equivalent al uh, alternative legal mechanism. And, sorry, just to add to that, uh, in our most recent discussion with the ICO, uh, the expectation is that the legislation of GDPR will continue to be supported once Brexit has taken place. Uh, there may be minor amendments to it, but the ICO have stated that they are looking to adopt these rules. Brilliant, thank you. <clears throat> Whilst I've got you actually, I think this one's also for you. Will the GDPR set up a one-stop shop for data privacy regulation? <laughs> okay, th this is a, this is a, a long-going discussion right now, and uh, it is still unclear as the standing position is highly varied. So the commission text has a fairly simple, concise rule in favor of the principle. Uh, and parliament has also promoted lead DPA and adds more involvement. Uh, but at this point of time, it's very difficult to try and understand exactly what next steps are going to be. Uh, and I am aware that there will be further information when it comes to a one-stop shop policy debate. So it'll have to be a wait and watch. Brilliant, thank you. Um, just scanning through here. Okay, so for knitting, this looks like, do we have to build the behavior rules? Do we need data scientists on our team? Um, good question. So you do not require data scientists on your team. Uh, what you will require um, for monitoring a solution like this is your security operations personnel. So people who understand security, because at the end of the day, the anomalies is gonna say, hey, this user um, logged in at an anomalous time, or he's sharing his account. And um, as a security operational personal, then you should be able to go in and investigate um, those kinds of events. The data science is transparent to the end users. It is used to do the calculations in the back end. It will provide you a view into what those calculations look like. For example, it will say, typically I see this user do uh, downloads once a day, and now I'm seeing him do it 100 times. So, it, so, the, so the end result is very easy to comprehend for a normal user. Um, so all you require is security, basic security, compliance, and privacy skill sets, not data science. Thank you. And do you require a theme tool to run? Sorry, what was the question? Do you oh, require a SIM tool to run? So, no, we do not require a, a, a SIM or a security event management solution for, for Securonix to be deployed. The solution has built-in connectors to 350 plus 
applications and systems in your environment. So it can directly integrate with your target system and, um, and consume data from them and start analyzing it. Brilliant, thank you. And what is the best practice to deploy your solution? So, um, so the best way to deploy the solution, uh, great question. So first thing you want to do is, and this is for Securonics or any monitoring tool you are deploying, you want to define your scope very clearly. Uh, and when I say define your scope, you want to de define which applications and systems you want to start monitoring with. Um, and what is the end result you're looking for, right? In case of GDPR, you're concerned about data breach and you're concerned about um, employees or external users accessing confidential data. So that is going to be your use case. So once you've defined your use case and you have identified where that your sensitive data is residing, then that becomes your scope of your deployment. So that's step one. Step two is the tool is going to do its magic and it's going to identify anomalies and it's going to identify incidents. You need to have a team that can consume that data and investigate because um, you're only as good as um, the investigations you do. Otherwise, the tool will keep identifying anomalies. Nobody's looking at it. It's not going to add value. So, so you want to make sure you have a team that, that does the investigation part. Um, so those are the two key things. Um, it's defining your right scope and then making sure once an anomaly is identified, you have an investigation team that can go look into the, into the threats. Brilliant, thank you. So I have, well, unfortunately we're out of time now. The session is telling me that we're coming to the end of the hour. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today to, to talk about GDPR. And thank you for everyone on the call that's joined us. And um, I know there are quite a few more questions that we need to get through. So we'll come back to you individually on those um, with, with responses from our experts that are on the call today. Um, you can also contact us through, um, sorry if I just get to the right slide. Um, you can also contact us with the contact details there in the bottom left hand side of the, the screen. Not to worry, we'll be sending those contact details out to all of you after this call today as well. So that if you do have any questions, you can come straight back to us there. And we can definitely have a conversation with you in more detail on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, so hopefully you found that interesting and we'd like to offer you, um, hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, look forward to seeing you on a future webinar with us.